Ahoy, mateys! How are we tonight? <laughs> Hello and welcome. We're glad you are all here. If we haven't met, I'm Sam, one of the pastors here at Shepherd. Turn to your neighbor and say we're at Shepherd. Ship, 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 shepherd. And uh, it's just an honor to be with you when I get to be here. Gabby occasionally allows me to come and be a part of this beautiful thing called Circuit in this community, and I am honored to do so. Quick question for you. Have you ever built a house of cards before? With your own bare hands. All right, raise your hand if you have not. I just got to make sure I got to, okay. I figured so. I figured so. That's why I needed to show you that little mini video. Give it up for Keith. He made that for me. Come on. Yeah. Out of his own bare hands, he made that. He made that. And, um, uh, and he, have you ever been to your grandma's house and been bored? Anybody in your life? Uh, no disrespect to grandmas everywhere. I love them. Um, the old me would have went on and on about how my grandma's house was really boring and smelly. Uh, but I'm not going to do that tonight. I'm not going to tell you it was boring and smelly. Uh, actually, I'm going to tell you it's boring and I accidentally just told you it was smelly. Hello? Hello? Are you with me tonight? Are you with me tonight? Yeah, yeah. But that's the old me. All right, the new me. So I remember going to my grandma's house, who was awfully um, old. She lived to be uh, 90 plus, everybody. And she lived in this really old house in this really small town, no joke. And there wasn't a lot to do. We didn't have a TV. We didn't have one of these things. We also didn't have the internet. And so there wasn't a ton to do at my grandma's house. So what we would do is we would take all these different stacks of cards and we would make little card houses. And um, it may look easy to you, but did you notice how it took him four hours? Uh, did you see the timer on the left there, or on the right? Um, it took him over four hours to build it from a whole deck. And it's a pretty challenging thing. And the concept of building a house of cards is one little whisper, one little bump, one little windy wangle thing, it could all come tumbling down. You guys know what a windy wangle thing is, right? Yeah. I don't know what I'm saying, but you know what I'm saying. And, and sometimes I think our faith can be like that. By the way, I, I made this handy-dandy um, uh, deck of card, house of cards last night at midnight. It was, I was really tired, and it wasn't going well, and I was going to glue it together, and I said, forget it. This is literally confangled, taped together, okay? Because it's tough, and I couldn't get it on stage without some sort of help anyway, you know what I'm saying? Um, because when it comes to House of Cards, they can easily topple down. And sometimes I think our faith can feel like a House of Cards. That one challenging question, one thing that comes down in our lives that causes us to question everything can be like a, a House of Cards that comes tumbling down. If you haven't uh, been confronted with challenging questions now, I have heard student after student have a faith that's what I thought was robust and strong, and they went off to college, and someone told them something about the Bible they did not know, and whoosh, their faith came tumbling down. Maybe you look at uh, science, and you go, well, science says that, that the world was built over you know, lots and lots and lots and perhaps millions of years, but the Bible says it was built in seven days. And whoosh, it comes tumbling down. Or you maybe read some violence that is in the Old Testament, and you're like, well, how could a good God allow these things to happen? And whoosh, the faith that we thought was robust comes tumbling down. You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you know you know what I'm talking about? But I do have good news for you tonight, that that our, the foundation of our faith, actually, if you are a Christian, is not the Bible. And let me pause and say, I'm very well aware that we're in the, this space, and many of us are on a, 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 a spectrum in terms of our faith. And maybe you're stepping in, and someone invited you, and you're very new to faith, and you don't know much about the Bible. Welcome in. I'm going to share a few things that are foundational tonight. If you've been around the journey a long time, or a, a medium amount of time, what I'm trying to do tonight is, is, is help you have a robust faith that can go the lifetime. That's our, that's our dream here at Circuit. And I don't want you to have to get a, a bump in the road when it comes to your faith when you don't have to. And the good news is that the foundation of your faith is actually not the Bible. The foundation of our faith is a person named Jesus Christ. This is the foundation of our faith, that we believe that there is a human that both uh, Christian scholars and non-Christian scholars believe that Jesus was a historical human on the planet and that he died. 
and the, the accounts that we actually do have about his life, eyewitness accounts, saw him dead, dead on their doorbell, and, you know, the gig was up, and yet raised to life again. And up to 500 people at one time saw him living again. So if you're a Jesus follower today, you don't have to be able to answer and defend every part of the Bible in order to be able to stand firm on your faith. Because the foundation of our faith actually isn't the Bible, it's Jesus. But the Bible is very important. You see, the Bible is a unified story that leads to, that points to Jesus. If you're a note taker or you have a camera, you might want to take a photo of that. Because there are moments where you're going to have questions, and we've got to ask with a new lens about what the Bible is truly about. From Genesis in the Old Testament to the New Testament, it's all actually unraveling and telling one story of humanity moving towards Jesus. Some people say that Jesus was just a, a good teacher and, and, and a good prophet, and that's all he claimed to be. My friends, this is untrue. Jesus claimed to be more than that. He claimed to be the fulfillment of what was promised in the Old Testament, to come through in the New Testament. Sometimes people say we can unhitch and leave the Old Testament behind. We don't actually have to do that as long as we understand that the story is ultimately pointing to Jesus. I want you to see what Jesus says about himself at the end of the Gospel of Luke, and we'll break down that, what that means in a minute. But Jesus is at the, he, he's lived, he's died, he rose again, he resurrected, and he, he revealed himself to people. And before he was going to be ascended back to heaven to God, so he could breathe on us the Holy Spirit. Before that was to take place, he gathered the disciples together and he said this. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about, everyone say that, what's that two letter word, one, two, three? Me. Let's say that together. One, two, three. Me. Who's about? Me. It's about Jesus. In the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. This is a fancy way of saying the Old Testament. The law of Moses was the Torah. The prophets was the historical books. And then the Psalms was a shorthand way of saying the Psalms, the Proverbs, the wisdom literature. Jesus is saying the Old Testament that they had in their hands, that they believed were written um, through humans by God, was fulfilled through the person of Jesus. That all of those stories were ultimately pointing to him. Now, what is the Bible? The Bible is simply 66 books. We look at it as one pleather-bound book. This is pleather. It's fake. It's all get out, all right? It looks like one book, but it's actually a collection of books. It's written by 40 authors over the span of 1,500 years. This narrative had been collected, passed around, told from generation to generation, actually long before it was actually put down on paper. It was in a culture where they would share the stories of God throughout history. And all of it was ultimately pointing to a person that would come. And it leads to one story. The entire book, with all those authors throughout all that time, tell one cohesive story. Not perfectly left to right because of how it's written, but throughout the Old Testament and how it's written, pointing to Jesus in the gospel accounts as the four Gospels written by four point of views about the person of Jesus. I've heard of people reading Matthew and then reading Mark and being like, there's an awful lot of repetition in this book. It's because it's four different eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus telling his story. It's broken down into an Old Testament, which is called the Hebrew Scriptures, and the New Testament. The Old Testament tells the story of the beginning, about how humanity was, was created, not by a fight amongst gods like so many other Genesis accounts, but by a God who stood alone. And this God whew, could breathe and speak, and life would come from him. 
And so he speaks life into humanity. The only, the only animals on the planet that had the ruach of life. God's breath whoo, spoken into humanity. And they were meant and designed to rule the world the right way. And what happened was is humans began to make a mess of themselves and they deviated from God's plan, fracturing the relationship and fracturing the story. And so the rest of the Old Testament, my friends, is a narrative, even though it gets confusing and challenging and hard at times, is a narrative about a God who loves his humans and wants to rescue them from themselves. You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you have some regrets and some pain and some shame in your life due to decisions that you made? I only know that that has to be true because that is true for me. That's true to my closest friends. That's true to my wife and my kids. That as we do life our own way, we make a mess of it. But God has been consistently pursuing humanity throughout the Old Testament until this moment after 400 years of silence where Jesus broke through. God broke through and decided, you know what? My last plan that I have is to show up in human form. And that's the New Testament shows how Jesus in human form fulfills where humanity could not fulfill themselves. As humans made a mess of themselves, there was a God, human, who came, who showed what true love was, gra uh, was like. He was all truth and all grace all the time. And he stepped onto the pages of history with a narrative that said, the God loves the entire human race, and I have come to rescue them. Not by brute force, but by sacrificing himself. And so the Gospels tell that narrative of just Jesus who came. And the letters to follow are to us and the first century believers and how to navigate this challenging life trying to be Jesus followers. And so as we look at the scripture, one thing that you could say is, it's breath on a page. Look at what it says in 2 Timothy. It says all scripture, everyone say all, one, two, three. All, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, basically training in the right way. In today's society, there's this concept of your truth is your truth. But scripture is pointing to one in the person of Jesus who was all grace and all truth all the time. And as we look into what's called breath on a page, if you want to know what God wants to say to you, if we can understand how to read this book, collection of books, and how it points to Jesus, we can find out where we fit in the story. I don't know about you, but if we took a massive selfie right now, who would you inevitably look for in the photo first? Yourself. That's not wrong. That's just human. We often want to put ourselves at the center of the story, don't we? And if we put ourselves in the proper place and allow God to point the right way, to become center stage, then we can find where we fit in the story. And preachers like me admittedly have done you a disservice at times because I know attention spans are challenging and life is hard. And we ask the question, I get it, Sam, but what does this have to do with me? And ultimately it has to lead to what it has to do with us or else it would be irrelevant. But I have stood on this stage and I've told a story about Jesus and then, and I do this, I make one tight Twitter phrase to insert into your life. That's my attempt at to help bridge the gap and help you see the Jesus story for yourself. But over time, if we're not careful, we accidentally think that we're the center of the story. And we're not. But if we can understand that God is the center of the story and he wants to use us in his plan to partner with humanity, 
then we will understand where we actually fit. And when a global pandemic hits, we will understand that he's still in control. And when we have these devices in our hands that can answer virtually all of uh, a whole bunch of questions about how the earth is made and, you know, ask Google anything, right? In the midst of technology, in the midst of hardship, in the midst of relationship challenge, if we put ourselves in the right part of the story, we can say, oh, this is God's story and here's how I fit and here's how my relationships fit in spite of that. But sometimes we go to the Bible like it's a science book, and we open up to Genesis chapter 1, the first book, and it says, in the beginning God created, you see how I'm just quoting it without even being there, just a flex, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. You see that? <laughs> you dirty dog dangler, he called me out. And, and, and what does it do? It tells the story about God creating the world, and we go, oh, Seven days, I, I, I've been told in my science book that it's like millions of years over time. But you see, we have to understand that, that bo this book is made up of all sorts of types of literature. You'll find it on the screen. All these different types of writing. You guys are smart. Do you know what I'm talking about? And so as we look at the Bible, we've got to ask ourselves, what kind of type of writing is happening because there are moments where the Bible will pivot from, for a, from a narrative to a poem. And if we don't know what we're stepping into, we'll make the wrong mistake. Look it, it's made up of narrative and poem and wisdom literature and prophetic literature and ancient biography is a fancy way of saying the Gospels. Parables, which are a fake story to prove a point. Letters written by humans to other humans in a certain context. Imagine if you picking up my phone and seeing a text message from Gabby, and it said, you look stylish all the time, D, uh, it doesn't say my name, let's just say, it just says, you look stylish all the time, and you pick up your phone, and all you wear is sweatpants every day of your life, and you're like, oh, look it, it says I'm stylish all the time, <laughs> that was weird, wasn't it? Can we just go backwards? I ask my wife if I can have a 10-second reset. All the time, I'm like, can I have a 10-second reset? I'll say something I shouldn't say, like mean or something. I'll be like, oh, I'm so sorry. Can I have a 10-second reset? And she gives me the 10-second reset. No reset? <laughs> I love you guys. Ah. So, but can you imagine picking up someone else's cell phone from someone else to, you, to someone else and I pick up Ethan's phone. Is this making sense at all? No. Sam texts Ethan. Rick, Kyle picks up phone. Kyle reads message from Sam to Pitzer. So and Kyle, th confused. you're still confused? So confused. <laughs> Imagine if someone wrote a letter to somebody else and you thought it was for you and you just read it as if it was for you. There you go. <laughs> I love these guys. You can't slip any BS by them. Oh, edit that out. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that. All right. All right. But I want you to know it depends on where we're reading. If you're looking at the gospel accounts, you've got to start in the beginning. Look at, look at Luke. It's about the story of Jesus. Stay with me. Forget all the bad things I've ever said. All right. Listen to this. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those who were from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. This man named Luke thoroughly investigated the life of Jesus and put it into an orderly account that us 2,000 years later could understand because we're stepping into a gospel account and the story about Jesus. Look at this one. This is Paul. And he's acknowledging that he's writing something significant to a group of people. 
And he says this, and we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, look at this, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. Paul was recognizing that he was writing something to a group of people that was inspired by God. And when we enter the story, we have to know where we're entering into. Not that Paul is directly writing from him to us, but to a group of people that we must understand a little bit of what's going on as we try to then apply it to our lives. I hope you understand that the Word of God is living and active, and God wants to speak to you through His Word. And what I understand to be true is it can be challenging. So what I want to do is I want to give you three questions as we close today. You may want to take a photo of these. What does this tell me about God and people? No matter where you enter into the story of God, you must ask the question, What does this tell me about God and people? We step into the wisdom literature and we understand that what it tells us about God is God has all the wisdom because he knows us best and he knows what's best for us and he has the right way for us to walk in life. What does it tell us about God and people when we read Genesis? That we are made in his image. It's in the first chapter. We get hung up on the creation part, but what he's trying to tell us is he created the whole world. He didn't... He used this word epoch as as a way of talking about time, but it doesn't necessarily have to mean seven literal days. It could. It might. But it might be just telling the story of God and humanity who was made in Genesis chapter 1, 26 in his image. So what does it say about God and people? Secondly, how does this text point to Jesus and my need for him? This is super important, my friends. Because, like I said, we accidentally make ourselves the hero. I do this all the time. We read David and Goliath, and David slings the rock, and he kills the giant, and he falls down. And then we sing, then we do a nice cute sermon about having five stones, and you can take down your Goliath of fear, and da-da-da-da, and that's okay. But the story is ultimately pointing to a hero named Jesus who wants to completely fulfill the prophecy. The Philistine was was an example of evil and oppression that David ultimately could not overcome in his lifetime. But that story is pointing to the one who can bring ultimate freedom and break all of humanity from bondage. Because the story is pointing to Jesus and our need for him. Lastly, how is Jesus inviting me to respond to this word? Is he inviting me to receive his grace and love? Is he inviting me to stand and trust him? Is he inviting me not to move and just soak in his peace? Is he inviting me to change something in my life that is harmful to me? You see, the scriptures will point us to a direction And sometimes we just think of it as a rule book. God doesn't want me to do this, this, or this. But what it really is, is a story that points to Jesus and how he's inviting us to live the best way, the life that will make you come alive on the inside, the life that no one can take your joy away based on circumstances that you cannot control. The older I get, the more I realize we can't control our circumstances. Don't want to scare anyone but there is no promise that you're going to get home safely tonight. I'm not trying to scare you. I mean, you'd be a very rich person if you could somehow promise to me that you'd get home safe tonight. You can't. You're not promised tomorrow. You're not promised to wake up one day and have this life that you have pictured in your head. You're not promised that. Because life hands us things that we won't, haven't expected. Challenges that we didn't realize would come down the pipe. 
So how do we traverse through that? We ask Jesus, God, you've lived through it all. You've endured it all. Can you help me in this battle I'm going through? My wife has been singing this song in this season. She's a nurse, and it's been challenging at work, and um, it's been challenges with some of our kids having some issues for another sermon. And she's been singing that song by Phil Wickham, When I Fight, I Fight on My Knees, with my hands lifted high. Why? Because the battle belongs to you. Because there's things we cannot control. And we've got to let go and let him lead us. If there was another way, if there was a better way, I would share that with you. But this is the best way I know how to tell you where life is truly found, where joy is truly found. And my hope and prayer for you is that you would know that whatever comes down the pipe, whatever question you have, that the Bible is not the foundation of your faith, but it's what the Bible points to, to Jesus. One unified story that leads to your foundation, Jesus. So when you have questions about the Bible, come to Jesus and come to Jesus' people. I wish someone would have told me this. I'm way out of time. I'll never be invited back. I wish someone would have told me this. I put my mortgage on the line, that there's not a question you could come up with about bi the Bible and God that does not have book upon book upon book already written and wrestled about. Bring your wrestles to Jesus. Bring your wrestles and doubts and questions to Jesus' people. And don't let doubt and questions take you out and be a house of cards because you serve a God who's alive and who's good and has a good plan for your life. Amen, church? Would you stand to your feet? I want to pray for you. Jesus, we thank you for these moments that we share. God, I know that tonight was a little bit more on the teaching side, but I know that you can use this message to be a firm foundation that no matter what questions we have, we can look to you. That the foundation of our faith is not the Bible, but what the Bible points